we must post it as part of our name, and it, it's a higher level of of uh, fiduciary that that we obtain with that. So that's what those, all those letters mean. Financial Phil McCoy, our guest here on the program. The Marius Group just recently recognized as the best outfit in the state, and congratulations once again on that, Phil. As I look at the markets, I see we've had a pretty good first couple of months, but in your two-minute synopsis uh, this morning, Phil, you mentioned that uh, not all the stocks had a great first couple of months, so there's still some room to grow here. Yeah, there is room, and it's not so much that they haven't, and we were talking in terms of recovery from what was a terrible 2022 and the end of 2021 yeah, you know, there were some asset classes or sectors that still haven't recovered yet, and in particular, small companies uh, that that doesn't fit on the S and P or the Nasdaq or the smaller companies that a lot of us haven't heard from, but we have exposure to. So that industry hasn't recovered yet, and the bond market. You know, so many of us. You know, the average. Uh, asset allocation, I, w- I would say, I'm guessing at this, so don't hold me to it, but I would say the average asset allocation is the old 60-40 model, where 60% of someone's assets are in equities and 40% are in bonds. Uh, that, I don't think that rings true for our client base, but overall, 60-40 model. Well, that 40% that's in bonds, that hasn't recovered yet. It had a really strong month in December of 2023 when our expectations were that the Federal Reserve uh, would start cutting rates in March. Now, here we are in March, and they're not going to cut rates in March. So what we had gained on the bond side of our portfolio in December, we had given some of it back in January and February. We're not all that concerned about the bond. We know that the Federal Reserve eventually will begin to cut rates, and that's where the, that bond side will pick up yet again. But small companies haven't recovered yet. Financials haven't really recovered yet. If we think back to Almost this time last year when some of the the fears that banks could fail started to creep in. And it was short-lived, but those financials hadn't fully recovered yet. I don't think the healthcare market has fully recovered yet. So there's a lot of sectors that haven't recovered. So it's unfair to your portfolio or to the fund that you have in your retirement account to look at it and say, well, hey, how come this hasn't fully recovered yet? The stock market's back yet. But when you look at the average asset allocation, if you have 60% as an average, if you have a 60% equity or stock exposure in your portfolio, well, only about half of that's probably made up of large companies. So you really only have about 30% of your overall uh, asset base inside of something that would would fit on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. So it's not really a clear indication that you should have recovered. No different than you probably didn't suffer as much in 2022 as what the S&P or the NASDAQ did. So so it's not completely fair if you're someone looking at your 401K and then judging, you know, Encompass or TSP or whoever it is to judge that and say, well, it's not doing as well. It's not made up yet. Not completely fair to do that to that because it's not really – apples to apples overall you know so you you would have to look at each individual indice and how your asset in that indice and it's difficult to do that but everything hasn't recovered yet but our overall s p and nasdaq the one we put most attention to the nasdaq was the last of the game to recover from that terrible 2022 and we just did that i think it was on friday where we we reached recovery intraday i don't know that we closed that way but we reached recovery intraday and that has been led by artificial intelligence which has been you know on the forefront of our minds in 2024 because of nvidia just a few weeks ago that's given us our biggest lift so far in 2024 billy yeah good morning phil i'm looking at uh, uh the long-term uh, cycle of a uh, uh, s p 500 and i noticed uh going back 30 or 40 years and from the first uh first half or two-thirds of that segment the market stayed around between a thousand and fifteen hundred uh, starting around 2011 it started a steady climb up to where we are today over five thousand uh with a couple of with some blips uh my question is why that and that far exceeds inflation my my question is why why are we seeing the steady climb uh climb since 2011 and that is the that is a great and simple answer great question with a very simple answer 
and it, it's not it's not satisfying sometimes to think of, but at the end of the day, these indices will follow company earnings. So if companies are profiting, if companies are making money, and we just went through that cycle, and it, it's helped us absorb uh, waiting on the Federal Reserve to decrease rates, but if companies are making money, then the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, those companies in that indice will cause it to rise. And companies have shown the uh, innate ability to continue to make money regardless of what the, uh, the, the circumstances around it would be, whether it's COVID. You know, we, I think the, the biggest triumph of our markets, if we go back, I, and I'm still just amazed by this, is I sat in my basement working during that period while we were all home, uh, the, the ability for the markets to recover in 2020 and companies to find a way. Now, it, it was a skinny top, if you will, you know, the Amazons of the world and those that were allowed or able to, to still profit or stay in business during COVID, but it was a skinny top. But overall, our, our economy still kept humming along with the help of Federal Reserve cutting rates and, and feeding Americans with money to spend but those companies still at the end of 2020, and I still remember thinking that J.P. Morgan had said it was at some point during April when we started, our market started to recover, not our economy. Our economy was at a very low point at that time. But the J.P. Morgan Chase said, and I may have even said it on air, and I probably shouldn't have, but J.P. Morgan said, I think the S&P 500 will recover by the end of the year. And I thought to myself, Wow, what a bold statement that is, considering that as you look at that chart, Bill, you'll see that there was a 40%, almost a 40% drop from mid, uh, mid-February. mid I think it started the day after Valentine's Day. From mid-February to March 23rd, we had almost a 40% drop in five weeks. And I thought that that was irresponsible of J.P. Morgan Chase, who can be a market mover. You know, when you hear these big financial companies and mutual funds make a statement, it can be a big financial mover. I thought it was irresponsible to say it shows how wrong I was, but because by the end of the year, because of the likes of the Amazons and the Zooms and the Microsoft Teams and technology that's really led the way, that it recovered and then some. So not only was I wrong, I was really wrong in my thought that J.P. Morgan shouldn't have, have stated that and put that in print. But at the end of the day, to answer your question, it's because companies still find a way to make money. Now, they're different companies. If you go back to when you started that 2011 climb, the biggest companies in the world have certainly changed. And, you know, now that with NVIDIA, you know, with the amazing, amazing growth of NVIDIA, it's one of the largest companies in the world, and it probably, I'm guessing, didn't crack the top 50 back in 2011. Amazon and the way that Apple has, even though Apple's had a bad year, but the way Apple has continued to grow. So the largest companies in the world now, opposed to what they look like in 2011, is completely different. And, and I'm, I'm assuming if you looked at the a top 10 list of the largest companies in the world, for the most part, you may find Microsoft and maybe one other that still held on to that top 10 spot. And most of them look like technology companies now. But Phil, companies, although different, yes. Excuse me, you still haven't answered my question. <laughs> uh, you've talked a yes, lot, but you haven't company. answered my question. Uh, my question <laughs> is, <laughs> what made the difference? We've been having companies making profit uh, for many, many, many years. We've had Xeroxes, we've had Hewlett Packards, we've had uh, IBMs, a lot of the technology companies. Uh, so. So over the, if you looked at an envelope for, say, 50, 60, 70 years, there have been companies making profits through all that. We've had tech, tech companies. But yet, why, starting around 2011, we've increased by a factor of 2.5 or 3? Because of the fall that we had before that. So you're starting at a, a low point at the, when we started this kind of bull market. So we started at a low point. But to answer your question, it is because companies continue to make money. That's the very short answer. It's different companies, but companies continue to make money, and consumers continue to spend. Mr. Gilstrap. Morning, Phil. <clears throat> Article in the Wall Street Journal today um, about reveals, I guess, that the vast majority, vast majority of 401k investors are passive investors, what they call, they, they put them, their 401ks into one of the big um, index funds and just kind of park it there. 
Uh, so it's going to be a two-part question, actually. One is, um, is that inherently a bad idea? And the second part is this. It also shows that um, Vanguard, which is the big boy in this in this this investment portfolio, they've got 1.3 trillion dollars in investment uh, under uh, under management. Is it possible to be too big on a fund like that? And uh, does it does that pose any extra dangers to investors? No, not really. And to answer, you know, when we talk about those index funds inside of 401ks, those are, I think, what they're referring to as target date funds, where you, you put in in the inception of those, we like when we can't have our hands on the money. We kind of like that people use those. You have to look at them at the target date funds to see how they're allocated, because vanguards may be different than fidelity. And what I mean by that, if you said, hey, I'm going to retire in 2050, they may be allocated differently. Vanguard's 2050 fund may be allocated allocated differently than Fidelity's 2050 fund. But those target date funds change as time goes on. So as you get closer to that target date, and I do think that's what the Wall Street Journal article was talking about, was the target date funds. As you get closer to that time frame, they become less and less aggressive and incorporate more bonds or, or more large-cap value companies to become less aggressive as time goes on to answer your question about is it a mistake to have too many funds inside of say vanguard in most cases that answer is also no because they're using a fund of funds if you will so it's a fund that is carrying funds inside of it so vanguard may say or fidelity or any of of these big 401k players they may be saying okay we're going to put uh 60 if you will in equity funds but inside of those equity funds, they're not individual stocks, or it's not just one equity fund. They could actually be using, and most of the time they'll use their own, but they could be using Fidelity uh, mutual funds, or they could be using uh, BlackRock mutual funds. Now, each one of those funds, if we keep going deeper, each one of the, especially equity funds, each one of those mutual funds could be invested in 200, up to 250, up to 250 individual companies so you could have one mutual fund that has exposure to 200 it is it's normally not that many but 200 individual companies and then another mutual fund could have exposure to it won't be completely different but they'll have exposure to a handful of individual companies so it is diversified in the companies that they hold even though it may not be as diversified as far as the funds are concerned your concern as an investor isn't really how vanguard is performing on the stock market or fidelity or jp morgan chase or wells fargo or any of those it's not how they're performing it's how the individual companies are performing for those mutual funds so you are safe if you will if you've got if you've got a lot of money with vanguard or a lot of money with fidelity but the, in the index funds uh, or, or I think what they're referring to are the target date funds that's come, become extremely popular inside because they are passive. You don't have to go in and rebalance them, and you don't have to peel back or, or come off of, if you will, some of the equity exposure as you get later on in your working years. It does it for you. Phil, what about Bitcoin? Bitcoin. 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 Sorry, you're right, Rob. I'm here for you. Bitcoin, <laughs> I appreciate and that is it. one thing that we – <laughs> Phil stays away from Bitcoin, baby. <laughs> we do stay away from Bitcoin inside of our office simply because you can't place an intrinsic value on it. So if you were to say to anyone, like, how do you determine what Bitcoin is worth? Now, in our world with equities, we can tell you that. We can say, hey, um, NVIDIA is worth this. Look at their balance sheet. And if you liquidated a company, it would be worth that. And this is this is why it's trading for this or that, mainly off of perception, but this is why it's trading this way. But with Bitcoin, you can't do that, and you, you have limited exposure in most cases inside of your ERISA accounts. And when I say ERISA, I mean your 401Ks. Uh, your IRA, it's a little bit looser. But here, being fiduciaries, we can't invest directly into crypto, any cryptocurrency inside of your accounts here at Ameriprise. What we can do is because now becoming more popular is exchange traded funds that, that have exposure to Bitcoin or like a Coinbase, a platform that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies trade on. But it, it seems to do, it has 
massive swings up and down, and I'm sure a lot of people have made a lot of money off of it, but just as many have lost a lot of money off of it. So it's not something we dabble in, and I would certainly not be the, the person to go to to ask a detailed question about it because of its volatility and the fact that we can't place a value on it, we don't we don't dabble in it. Yeah, I and I understand uh, a lot of that. Uh, but I look at the I'm look again looking at graphs since February. It has gone up over twenty five thousand uh, dollars. What drives swings like that, either up or down? I know in the past couple or so years it's gone down as fast as it's gone up. But what drives vol- volatility? It's up four percent alone today, by the way. <laughs> Demand, you know, people wanting it and people buying into it, and the large purchases that you can make with it. I remember a time when Tesla, and I don't know if they're coming back to this, but you could purchase a Tesla uh, on Bitcoin and with Bitcoin or with some type of cryptocurrency, and that really shot its value up because it was becoming more mainstream. You can use this to purchase things, and, and it really shot its value up. What brought its value down or one of the triggers that brought its value down was the regulation that China put on it. And once China's government put regulation on it, and that's a fear that I have as well, even in the United States, but once China put regulation on it, it really, really dropped. Now, if the United States did that, and when I say regulation, what I'm really referring to is taxes. If they put a different tax level on it or make it not as tax efficient as what everything else would be, and that that could hinder its growth because then it becomes painful at this time of year when you go to do your taxes if you're trading on Bitcoin, if they change those tax rates, then then right now it's taxed just like anything else. But if they change those tax rates or place deeper regulation on it, then it then it would slow down its growth. The way they tax Bitcoin, if it stays that way, it will never be a, a currency anybody adopts because as as a main currency, because it's a pain in the butt. I mean, you 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 have Bitcoin, and then as it appreciates, you get taxed on it. So when you use it to pay your rent, you could actually get a capital gains tax yes. because it's worth more. If yes. they applied that same theory to the dollar, then every time you spent a dollar, you'd have to check out what the exchange rate was around the world for what the dollar's worth. And you have to pay income tax every time you used a dollar because it might be worth four cents more today than it was yesterday. And that's what they do to Bitcoin. Yes. It's, it's, it's not yes. an even... Take away the intrinsic value questions, Phil, which I agree. I, I have no idea why Bitcoin is worth $65,000 because somebody says it is. But if you apply those, that same logic to the dollar, who would use their dollars? Isn't that the very definition of a bubble? We have decided that a, uh, the Bitcoin, which isn't a real thing, is worth what it is because we say it's worth what it is. And it takes one person to say, no, it's not. You have somebody important to say, no, it's not. And then it just collapses. I mean, we've seen huge swings in Bitcoin over the years. Yeah, just a few months ago, yeah. I think it was around twelve uh, twelve thousand dollars, fifteen thousand yeah. dollars. Today, it's sixty five thousand dollars. Exactly, and it, and it went through that cycle before. Where I don't know has it has it eclipsed? I don't know this. Has it eclipsed its all time high? So we're talking about our stock markets recovering, but Bitcoin hasn't. Uh, and if they have, it was just here recently, where it has gotten back to its all time high before they place those regulations from China on it. So. That, that's just some of those things that you guys are regurgitating is the exact reason that we, you know, we don't we don't dabble in it as far as the long term plan. We do not regurgitate on this show, Phil. That's that's not what we do. We make wise statements. We do not regurgitate or penetrating questions. When I when I had that cough, that was pretty bad. I was regurgitating a good bit there. Uh, financial Phil, how do we get in touch with you for more information today? You can reach us at three zero four two six. Three four three four three, or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue, right here, Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, guys.